Hello everyone, welcome to the uh, first online lecture. Kind of a weird format obviously. Uh, what I'm going to do, just uh, do a quick practice here. I'm basically going to do a couple of pages of uh, our current packet and uh, just to see how it works uh, first time around. Okay, so let's get started. Um, as we saw in previous lectures, um, we have ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are formed when we have a metal and a non-metal, which when they mix, an electron is transferred. You may recall that from uh, the previous lecture. Remember the, the obvious thing that metals lose electrons and turn to plus ions, and non-metals, anions, will form, gain electrons, to form minus ions. That's why we have Na plus Cl minus, for example, as a formula. Okay, so as you see in the box here, ionic compounds are only formed between metals forming cations, which are plus ions, and non-metals forming anions, which are minus ions. If you remember the periodic table, anything on the left, if you remember that diagonal line, and then we'll show you a periodic table in a second, anything on the left is classified as a metal, so would, for example, iron or something, make a plus ion, lose electrons, and a non-metal on the right would gain an electron, make a minus ion, and the plus and minus ions created would stick together because plus attracts minus. Now, the discussion section here, and you know, I'll hold this up to the camera in a minute so you can see it more clearly. In the discussion section here, we're going to talk about what would happen when we mix two non-metals, what would you expect? So if I have, for example, a chlorine and a chlorine, and I bump them together, what would you expect to happen? Well, they obviously form a compound, which is Cl2. But is that an ionic bond? The answer is no, because, make that sure that's a chlorine. The answer is no, that's not an ionic bond because they're both non-metals. Remember, a non-metal gains an electron and a metal loses because they both can't gain. No one wins if you like a tug of war. Okay, so to answer the simple question, when two non-metals are mixed, would you expect an ionic bond? Answer is no, because they're both electron stealers. Why? Well, as you can see here, we have one of my favorite slides from the entire semester, which is a periodic table featuring electronegativity. Electronegativity. We'll just call it EN for short. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom to steal electrons. It's like strength. Think of someone strong, they have a strong electronegativity. Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example. Think of someone weak, low electronegativity. P. Wee Herman. As we can see, maybe I'll show you the slide from the back of the packet. As we can see, the strongest atom in nature is fluorine. Okay, fluorine has the highest electronegativity value, whereas the weakest, the P. Wee Herman of the periodic table, is cesium. And this illustrates nicely the bottom left to top right trend in the periodic table. Weak, bottom left, strong, top right. Okay, bottom left is the most metallic, top right is the least metallic. And if you remember, about there, that diagonal is a dividing line between metals and non-metals, which we see as a nice difference in elevation, if you like, on this chart. Okay, so that's a really nice graph of electronegativity. Back to our question. Electronegativity is the cause of this ionic bonding. Okay, so we need a big difference in electronegativity for our ionic bond. Mix a weak with a strong and we get an ionic bond. Okay, That only happens when we have a metal from the left mixed with a non-metal from the right. Now, as we go through, I know I'm going, uh, you know, without any interaction with you guys. Let me just move that up. I know I'm going through without any interaction from you guys, but uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to kind of comment in the discussion area, right, right under where this is posted. Okay. Now, bottom line then, a difference in electronegativity determines the type of bonding. If it's a large difference, it's ionic. 
So we can write that there. Large difference, electronegativity. And if it's covalent, which is the other covalent, if it's the other form of bonding, it's a small difference in electronegativity. Okay, so let's hold that up so you can see it. Remember, also you can pause this at any time. You have that power, right? Okay, so there's our uh, kind of box discussion, okay, talking about electronegativity differences causing essentially differences in bonding type. Okay, now here's an example. So if we look at our example in the box there, so atoms close together, two righties, top right hand corner of the periodic table, two righties, both strong and similar strength. No one wins that tug of war for the electron. The electron is in fact shared as a pair, usually one from each atom. We call that a covalent bond. So carbon, we can see down here, carbon and oxygen, both top right. When they stick together to make a compound we know exists, carbon dioxide, that bond will be a shared electron pair bond because of a similar electronegativity strength. If we look to the next one, our classic, sodium chloride, sodium's weak, chlorine is strong, the electrons will jump over, maybe I'll show a picture there. If you remember that slide from before, that's uh, something we did. Okay, so the electron will jump over, make a plus Na and a minus Cl. Why does that happen? Because we have sodium in the metallic side over here, and chlorine, chlorine becomes chloride, remember, as it becomes an ion over there. We have the purple side, which is metals, they're weak. Green, non-metal side, sorry, yeah, I'm right. So let's just rephrase that. Metals on the left are weak, low electronegativity. Non-metals on the right are strong, high electronegativity. So a lefty and a righty will always make an ionic compound with the theft of an electron, if you wish. Whereas these two mix together, anything from the green area mixed with another green, both strong, will make a covalent. Car carbon and oxygen, carbon dioxide. Now remember I mentioned this in class, it's just like making a restaurant. What do you do when you form a restaurant? Obviously you wait for the uh, COVID-19 virus to go away, and that's a bad joke. But really what do you do? It's all about location, location, location. You can tell the nature of any bond by where the atoms are in the periodic table. If it's a lefty, any lefty, with any righty, it's ionic. We saw sodium chloride. It could have easily been magnesium sulfide, for example. Anything from the left with anything from the right, atoms-wise, makes an ionic. Two from the right make a covalent, which we'll get onto in a little bit more detail in a moment. Okay, so here's our summary. Only a non-metal, top right, with a metal, essentially bottom left, make giant ionic compounds. Turns out that ionic compounds are always giant because of the non-directional nature of the bonding. If you think about a magnet or even a charge, they radiate their attractiveness in all, all directions. So that results in a non-directional bond, which we know as an ionic bond or a lattice. So we have like a pile of ions arranged attracting plus to minus. Okay, we call that arrangement, a lattice. Okay, however, if I'm shaking hands, if I have a shared pair of electrons, I have direction. So if I mix a non-metal top right with another top right, I have a covalent bond which has a definite direction. So for example, in water, which we'll show you in a minute, it's like H and O are holding hands, but in sodium chloride, Na plus radiates its attractiveness in all directions, so it can bond in any direction. Okay, so let's look now at this uh, table I think we've seen before, but we'll go through it. Based on the following materials formula, predict if they're either ionic or covalent, and therefore the structure. Okay, so a nice easy one to start, table salt, obviously table salt plus minus ions, lefty and a righty, so that's ionic. Structure, as we know, we've seen the crystals of table salt in our cupboard or our fridge or freezer, wherever, 
why would you keep salt in the fridge? I don't know. Okay. But anyway, structure is giant. So we see that relationship between ionic and giant right there. If we look at nitrogen gas, which is just two nitrogens stuck together, we know that to be a molecule, right? That's for sure. We know that to be a molecule. They have identical strength, therefore perfectly shared electrons, perfect covalent bond. It's interesting. It's interesting, things that are molecular elements have the purest covalent bonds because they have identical electronegativities, identical strength. It's a tug of war between two identical twins. No one wins the little flag if you think for a tug of war. It stays right in the middle. Okay, now, rust, <laughs> my car door, right? So my car door is a giant structure. Okay, last time I looked, it's big, right? So we can kind of make an assumption here, hey, giant or ionic, and that makes sense because it's iron and oxide. Iron oxide is rust, which makes it ionic, metal and non-metal. Now, if we go back to the ionic table here, or the electronegativity table, we see that hydrogen, although it's written here, in kind of the yellow, it's kind of in between. It's kind of right on the border between metal and non-metal. So we have to kind of take it on a case-by-case -case basis. We know, for example, that water is molecular. We know that for sure. So therefore, we can make the assumption that it's a covalent bond. It's actually something called polar covalent, which is halfway between ionic and covalent. But for now, let's just call it covalent. So. What important structure do you, what important relationship do you see between structure and bonding? Ionic equals giant. Covalent equals molecular. Okay, so let's bring that up to camera. Remember you can pause this at any time so you can catch the details. There we go. All right. We're going to get onto naming molecular elements and compounds in a moment, but what I want to do is actually stop the video now and I'll post it. Okay, I want you to tell me, and I'll give you some points for getting back to me. Okay, I want you to tell me if you're able to uh, first download this, which is a silly thing to say if you can't download it because you can't hear me, right? But feel free to communicate with others. Okay, let me know if you're able to download it, if you have any problems there. Okay, and if you're able to view it. And then secondly, if you think there's anything I can do to make your uh, end user experience better, okay, what I'm trying to do is emulate how we do this in class. So I'm actually going through the packets. I want you guys to fill out the packets as we go. And remember, you have the power of the pause button. You can pause it if you want more time. So feel free to do that. I'm not going anywhere, okay? It's just an upload. You don't have to keep up. So in a way, it's a little better than class. If you're having a little bit of problems maybe keeping up with the pace in class, this is, may work better for you, but we'll see. Okay, so let's stop there. Get back to me with some uh, comments. Tell me what you think.